بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله Ibrahim bin Adham was particularly famous for his pious scrupulosity. It is told that he said, watch carefully what you eat, and then there will be no harm for you in not staying awake during the night or fasting during the day. His most common prayer was, O oh God, remove me, remove me from the disgrace of disobedience to you, to the glory of obedience to you. Someone said to Ibrahim bin Adham, meat has become expensive. He answered, make it cheaper, that is, do not buy it. He then recited the following verse, when someone becomes too expensive for me, I abandon it. When, when something becomes too expensive for me, I abandon it. Therefore, the most, the more expensive it becomes, the cheaper it is for me. Muhammad bin Al Hussein, may God have mercy on him, said, "I heard Masru, Mas, Mansur bin Abdullah say. I heard Muhammad bin Hamid say. I heard Ahmed bin Khadrawah, Khidrawah say. Ibrahim bin Adham." said to a man who was performing a circumambulation of the Kaaba, know that you will not attain the rank of the righteous until you have climbed six mountain peaks. First, you must shut the door of pleasant life and open the door of hardship. Second, you must shut the door of self-glorification and open the door of humility. Third, you must shut the door of quiet and open the door of self-exertion. Fourth, you must shut the door of sleep and open the door of vigil. Fifth, you must shut the door of wealth and open the door of poverty. Sixth, you must, sh you must shut the door of hope and open the door of readiness for death. Once Ibrahim bin Adham was guarding a vineyard, a soldier who was passing by told him, give me some of those grapes. Ibrahim bin Adham replied, the owner forbade me to do this. So the soldier began to lash him with his whip. Ibrahim bin Adham lowered his head and said, beat this head for it, for it disobeys God often. On hearing this, the soldier was unable to continue the beating and departed. Sahal bin Ibrahim said, I was a companion of Ibrahim bin Adham. When I became ill, he spent all his wages on me. When I felt craving for some food, he sold his donkey and spent all of, his, all of its cost on me. When I began to recover, I asked him, Ibrahim, where is the donkey? He answered, I sold it. I told him, what shall I be riding on? He said, on my neck, my brother. And he carried me for three way stations. Abdul Fail Dhul Il Nur Al Misri. His name is Thauban bin Ibrahim. He was also called Abul Faid Abul Faid bin Ibrahim. His father was a Nubian. He Dhul Dhul Il Nun died in two hundred and forty five. He excelled in his affair and was unique in his age in respect of knowledge, pious scrupulosity, spiritual state and good manners. Some people denounced him as a heretic to the Caliph al-Mutawakkil and the latter commanded that he be brought before him from Egypt. When Dhul Nun appeared before him and admonished him, Al Mutawakkil began to cry and ordered that he be taken back to Egypt with honor. Since then, each time someone mentioned pious people to Al Mutawakkil, 
he would cry and say, whenever one speaks of the pious, let them first mention Dhul Noon. He was a slim man with a light skin, whose beard was not white. I heard Ahmed bin Muhammad say, I heard Sa'id bin Uthman say, I heard that Dhul Noon said, everything hinges on four things. The love of the glorious, the love of the glorious one, the hatred of the insufficient, the observance of the revealed, and the fear of changing from one state to another. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein, may God have mercy on him, say, I heard Sa'id bin Ahmad bin Ja'far say, I heard Muhammad bin Ahmad bin Sahal say, I heard Sa'id bin Uthman say, I heard Dhul Noon say, one of, the, one of the signs of the lover of God is his following in the footsteps of God's beloved. May God bless and greet him. In his character traits, his deeds, his precepts and his customs. Someone asked Dhul Noon about ignoble people. He answered, those who neither know the way to God nor try to know it. I heard Abu Abdul Abu Abdul Rahman as Sulami, may God have mercy on him, say, I heard Abu Bakr bin Muhammad bin Abdullah bin Shadhan say, I heard Yusuf bin al Hussein say, one day I was at Dhul Noon's teaching session. There came to him Salim al Maghribi and asked him, Abul Abul Faid, what was the cause of your repentance? He answered, it was something really wonderful that you cannot imitate. Salim said, for the sake of God, tell me about it. Dhulnoon said, I wanted to go from old Cairo to a village in the countryside. I fell asleep in the desert, and when I opened my eyes, I saw a small blind fledging that fell from its nest onto the ground. Suddenly the earth cleft and there appeared from the crack two food bowls, one silver and the other gold. In one there was in one there were sesame seeds, in the other water. The fledging ate from one bowl and drank from the other. I cried out, This is enough for me, I have repented. And and I was waiting at God's door until he agreed to receive me. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein say, I heard Ali bin al Hafiz say, I heard Ibn, Ibn Rashid Ibn say, I heard Abu Dujana say, I heard Dhul Noon say, Wisdom does not live in a stomach filled with food. Someone asked Dhul Noon about repentance. He answered, The common people repent from their sins whereas God's elect people repent from neglectfulness. Abu Ali al-Fudayl bin, bin Ayyad. He came from Khorasan, from the region of Marw. It is said that he was born in Samarkand, Samarkand and grew up at Abiward. He died in Mecca in the month of Muharram in the year 187. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein say, Abu Bakr Muhammad bin Ja'far told us, Al Hassan bin Abdullah al Askari told us, the son of Abu Dura's brother told us, Muhammad bin Ishaq bin, bin Rahuya Rahawa, Rahawa told us, Abu Amr told us on the authority of Al Fubail bin Musa that Al Fubail bin Ayyad was a dangerous young lad who robbed caravans between Abiward and Sarakah. The reason for his repentance was the following. He fell in love with a slave girl and as, and as he was climbing up the wall in order to meet her, he heard a Quran reader reciting, isn't it time that the hearts of those who believe should be humbled to the remembrance of God? And he said, O oh my Lord, it is indeed the time. 
and turned back. The night brought him to some ruins. There, were, there was a group of people there. Some of them said, let's go. Others said, let's wait until dawn, for al Fudail is on the way and may rob us. On hearing this, al Fudail repented and took them under his protection. Later, he settled down in the holy city and died there. al Fudail said, when God loves his servant, he bestows on him much grief. And when he hates his servant, he grants him abundance in this world. Ibn, Ibn al-Mubarak said, when al fudail died, sorrow departed with him. al fudail said, if this world with all that is in it were offered to me and I were not held responsible for enjoying, for enjoying it, I would still turn away from it in disgust, as you would turn away from a decaying corpse while passing by it in order not to smear your clothes with it. al fudail said, I would rather swear that I am a hypocrite than that I am not a hypocrite. al fudail said, no, not to act for the sake of others is hypocrisy, while to act for the sake of others is polytheism. Abu, Abu Ali al-Razi said, I accompanied al fudail for 30 years without ever seeing him laughing or smiling, except for the day when his son Ali died. I asked him about this. He said, if God loves something, I love it too. al fudail said, whenever I disobey God, I know this from the behavior of my donkey and my servant. Abu Jazak Jazak Allah. 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 Sufyan al-Thawri said, Renunciation of the world is reduction of hope for worldly gain, not eating coarse foods or wearing a rough cloak. He said, I have never seen anything easier than abstaining. Whatever your self devises, abandon it. He said, Someone saw him in he someone saw him in a, in a dream with a pair of wings flying in paradise from tree to tree. He asked Thawri, by what means were you granted this? He replied, by abstention. He Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, flesh eaters are those who backbite. They eat human flesh. He Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, there is a punishment for all things. The punishment for the Gnostic is to be cut off from his remembrance. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, five souls are the most dignified in creation. A scholar who is not self-indulgent, self moderate, a Sufi jurisprudent, a humble rich person, a thankful poor one, and a noble who follows the sunnah. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, Mourning and wailing have ten kinds, of which nine are full of show of, and only one kind is full of reality. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, If one tear falls on account of fear of God, it is better than fasting throughout life. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, He who spends life in remoteness is much better for it was the practice of the foremost saintly people. They liked to live comely instead of grandeur. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, the king who seeks company of the ascetics is superior to that ascetic, uh, that ascetic who seeks nearness of the king. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, so someone asked, what is the meaning of certainty? He replied, it is the name of the inner voice and the folk of certainty arrive at gnosis and the meaning of certainty is that every affliction be considered sent by Allah. He rahimahullah ta'ala warned Hazrat Hatim of four things. To revile people by allegations that renders one heedless of divine injunctions. To be envious of the higher rank of any Muslim makes one unthankful to Allah. Amassing wealth by unfair means makes one oblivious of the life in the hereafter. 
to ignore warning of God most high and express dejection of his promises causes infidelity. Sell, he, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, sell not the friendship of the Lord for the friendship of the world and its positions. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, I fear to accept anything from anybody, lest my heart should start cherish, cherishing love for that person. I desire only to live in his thoughts. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, worse than sin against God is sin against man. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, for the people of the world, uh, sleep is more profitable than to keep awake. For then they keep off worldly, worldly discourses during sleep. Rabi'a al-Adawiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, Rabi'a was a God-intoxicated woman, saint, who introduced the doctrine of pure love or disinterested love of God. Love for Rabi'a is the basis of spiritual perfection at all the stages on the journey to God. She teaches to love God for the sake of God. In her prayer to God, she says, O oh my Lord, if I worship thee on account of the fear of hell, burn me in hell. And if I worship thee with the hope of paradise, exclude me from it. But if I worship thee for thine own sake, then withhold not from me thine eternal beauty. She, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, I have not served God for fear of hell, for I should be like a wretched hireling if I did it for fear, nor love uh, for, of paradise, for I should be a bad servant if I served for the sake of what was given. But I have served him only for the love of him and out of desire for him. One day, Rabi'a was seen carrying fire in one hand and water on the other, and she was running with speed. People asked her what was the meaning of her action and where she was going. She replied, I'm going to light a fire in paradise and pour water onto the hell so that both whales may completely disappear from the pilgrims and their purpose may be sure and the servants of God may see him without any object of hope or motive of fear. She, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, Rep repentance is attained by the saints with the divine grace, and it comes from the side of God who enlightens the hearts of those whom he loves. Seeking a formal forgiveness is the sin for lying. If I seek repentance of myself, I shall have need of repentance again. She, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, seclusion is the soul's ideal preparation for reaching God. It is in the state of solitude that the soul contemplates on the attributes of God. She, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, the soul comes from God and it can be united with him if it is purified through the process of mortification. She, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, when asked about some worldly thing she wanted to have, she replied, I am ashamed to ask for a thing of this world from him to whom this world belongs. How can I ask for it from those to whom it does not belong? She, she asked in her private prayer, Oh my Lord, will you burn in the fire a heart that holds love for you? The caller answered, We will never do such a thing. Do not think so poorly of us. Once she fell ill and someone asked her the cause of her illness, she replied, because I turned my heart to paradise, he chastised me. Now he is content with me. I will not do it again. She was, she was asked, when is the servant satisfied? She replied, when afflictions delight him as much as blessings. None of the matter of this world or of the next should deter you from Allah. Rabi'a said, while I am in this world, all I want from the world is this world is to remember you. And my only wish for the hereafter is to be able to see you. Other than this, do with me as you wish. Once a saint came and proposed with a proposal of marriage with her, she asked, have you any miraculous power? She said, 
What uh, uh, he said, I have. She inquired, what is that? I can, he said, I can stop flow of water in the river. She said, well, you can stop flow of water in river, but cannot stop a drop of your own water. Get out of my house at once. Otherwise, I will make an end of your sainthood immediately. Fariduddin Attar describes the mystical personality of Rabia set apart in the seclusion of holiness. That woman wailed with the wail of religious sincerity, that one inflamed with love and longing, enamored with the desire to approach her God and be consumed in his glory, that woman who lost herself in union with him, that one accepted by mankind as a second spotless Mary, Rabia had no match as regards to her affinity with God and the knowledge of God, Ma'arifa. Udayl ibn Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, it is offensive that there should be seen in the outward appearance of a man more humility than what is in his heart. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, only the fearful one sees the fearful. It is the mother without her child who likes to see them other mourning, other mourning mothers. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, the scholars of the merciful possess humility and submissiveness, and the scholars of the rulers possess pride and arrogance. Whoever considers his soul to be of any worth has no share of submissiveness. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, submit to the truth, Obey it and accept it from whoever says it. This is submissiveness. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, God revealed to the mountain, I will speak a prophet upon one of you. So the mountains raised themselves high in pride while Mount Sinai lowered itself humbly. Then God spoke to Moses on this mountain because of his humility. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد بسم الله محمد بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The Book of Worship Knowledge is of two kinds Knowledge of practical religion and knowledge of spiritual matters The knowledge which is compulsory appertains to practical religion which deal with three matter beliefs, actions, and prohibitions. For instance, when a sane man attains puberty, it becomes compulsory on him to learn the words of attestation. There is no deity but God, and Muhammad وسلم, is the servant and apostle of God. To know its inner meaning does not then become compulsory on him. He is to believe it without any doubt or and proof. The Prophet wasallam first required only mere verbal acceptance of Islam and confession of faith from the Arabs. What was compulsory on them at the time was fulfilled. After that, knowledge of the duties to do became compulsory on them. These duties deal with actions and prohibitions. As regards to actions, if a Muslim reaches the early afternoon prayer, it becomes compulsory on him to know first how to pray it and to put it into action. This is the case with him in case of other prayers also. If he lives up to the month of Ramadan, it becomes compulsory on him to know the rules of fasting and then to fast. This is the case with pilgrimage, zakat, and other duties ordained by God and binding on all Muslims. As to prohibitions, it depends upon circumstances and new events. It is not compulsory on the blind man to know which sight is unlawful, on the mute to know which words are unlawful. So to know a thing is not compulsory on a Muslim who does not require it. If after the acceptance of Islam, there is anybody who wears silk dress and takes property of another man by force or looks into a strange woman with passion, with passion, he must know how to restrain himself from these things. As to beliefs and thoughts of mind, 
their knowledge is obligatory according to the state of mind. Thus, if a man feels any doubt in his mind about the meaning of attestation formula, formulas, it then becomes compulsory on him to know what will remove that doubt. When a duty becomes binding of a, on a man, to acquire knowledge about it becomes binding on him. As a man is not free from hatred, envy and impulses of evil, it becomes compulsory on him to know some of the evils as described in the book of destructive evils. Why should it not be compulsory when the Prophet sallallahu said, three things are destructive, sordid miserliness, vehement passion and self-conceit. Other evils follow these three destructive evils. To remove these evils from mind is compulsory. If a man is, convert, if a man is converted to Islam, what is compulsory on him is to believe in paradise, hell, resurrection day, judgment day. The Prophet ﷺ said, to acquire learning is binding on every Muslim. If he does not, if he did not, he did not say to learn alif, lam, or meme, but he said to learn the science of actions. As actions become gradually compulsory on him, to acquire knowledge about these duties becomes gradually compulsory on him. Fard al kifaya, compulsory duty on community. Know, O oh dear readers, that learning about the duties are divided into two categories those which are connected with religion and those which are not so connected. The religious learning are those which came from the holy prophets and in which there is no question of intellect, and the learnings that are not connected with the religion are mathematics, medicine, etc. They are of three kinds, praiseworthy, blameworthy, and permissible. The sciences which are necessary for, pro for progress in the world are praiseworthy, such as medicine, mathematics, etc. These are fard al kifaya or binding on the community as a whole. Fard al kifaya is such compulsory duty without which no nation can go on in this world. If a man at least acquires such learning or science in a town or locality, all other people in the town or locality get absolved from its sin. If, however, nobody learns it, all will be transgressors. The sciences which should be learned for agriculture, administration, industry, horticulture, weaving, etc. are fard al kifaya. To be expert in such learnings is not fard al kifaya. The learnings which are blameworthy are sorcery, talismanic, science, juggling, gambling, and the like. The learnings which are permissible are poetry, history, geography, biology, etc. <coughs> All learnings connected with the religion are praiseworthy, but when any other learning is mixed with any of them, it becomes sometimes blameworthy. The, pr the praiseworthy learnings comprise sources, branches, helpful and supplementary learnings. They are therefore of four kinds. One, sources of religious learnings are four in number. A, the book of God, the sunnah and usages of the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the unanimous opinions of Muslim jurists, ijma, and the sayings of companions. Ijma is the third source of Islam as it shows the path towards the usages of the Prophet ﷺ. The first source is the Qur'an and the second is the Sunnah. The fourth source is the sayings of the companions because they saw the Prophet ﷺ witness the coming down of re uh, to revelations and they saw what others did not see through their association with the Prophet ﷺ. Two, Branches of learnings of religion are drawn from the sources not according to the literal meaning, but according to the meaning adduced by the mind. 
thereby writing the understanding as indicated by the following hadith, a judge shall not sit in judgment when angry. This means that he shall not pass judgment when he is pressed by calls of nature, hunger and disease. The last thing is of two kinds. One kind relates to the activities of the world, such as the books of law, and is entrusted to the lawyers and jurisprudent. And the other kind relates to the activities of the hereafter. The latter is the science of the conditions of the heart and of its praiseworthy virtues and blameworthy evils. Three, the third is the sciences helpful to the praiseworthy sciences, such as the science of language and grammar, which are necessary to know the Quran and Sunnah. They are not themselves religious education. They are not, necess they are not necessary for the holy for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he was illiterate. The four, fourth, the fourth kind is the supplementary sciences and is connected with pronunciation of words and different readings and meanings, such as tafsir, knowledge of revocation of verses, books on authoritative transmission, biographies of illustrious companions and narrators of traditions. These are the religious learnings and are praiseworthy and as such farda kefaya or binding on the community as a whole. If you if you question why have you included fiqh or jurisprudence within the worldly sciences and faqih or juris, jurisprudent as worldly scholars, the reply is this. Fiqh contains the laws of the administration of the world and faqih are such lawyers. There is of course no doubt that a faqih also deals with religion, but that is done through the intermediary of this world as the world is the seed ground of the hereafter. The religion does not become perfect without the world. If you leave the religion with the rulers, you will find that the religion is the foundation and the ruler is its God. That which has got no foundation, it destroyed. That, that which has no foundation, it destroyed. And that which has got no God is also destroyed. Rule cannot go without a ruler and the instrument of rule is fiqh or administrative laws. The government does not belong primarily to the religious sciences. It is well known that pilgrimage does not become perfect unless a companion is taken for protection from the ruffians and robbers in journey. But hajj or pilgrimage is one thing. Rule for pilgrimage is another thing. God is a third thing and the laws are a fourth thing. The object of fiqh is to give knowledge of administration. This is supported by the following hadith. Nobody can give legal decision except three. Ruler, authorized agent, and one not so authorized and, and who gives decisions out of his own accord. A ruler or leader is, the, is qualified to give legal decisions. One who is authorized by him is his deputy. Except these two, the third person is called an intruder who undertakes the responsibility himself. The companions in general refrained from giving legal decisions, but when they were asked about the Quran and the learnings of the hereafter, they did not remain silent. <laughs>